Good morning, beloved, and happy Resurrection Day. I'm going to ask you ahead of time to extend your patience a little. We'll just go a bit over time today, just a little bit, because it is a special Sunday. And before we begin with the message, I'm going to call up to our stage for our collective prayer, a new pastoral apprentice for GCF. And I'm going to call on stage the family of our brother Jello Tuanki, who will go up together with his wife and child. What is a pastoral apprentice? A pastoral apprentice is somebody who is praying if God is calling him to the full-time ministry. At the same time, for the next year or two years, he'll be mentored by me personally. And we as a church will also be praying for him. And if God puts it in his heart, and God puts it in the church's heart, especially the leaders, to call him, when these two meet, then we know God is calling him. The outcome could be he could be a full-time pastor, or he could remain as a dentist in a very successful practice, and yet still be called a lay pastor. And God has already produced some pastors for us from our pastoral apprentice program, Homegrown pastors, we call it. Brothers and sisters, from this day forward, you will be calling him not just Dr. Jello Tuanki, DMD. He will also be called Pastor Jello Tuanki. Could you please extend your hands towards him as I pray for him? Meaning to say, you will also pray for him and his wife and daughter. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, because the call to serve you can only come from your love for your flock and for the person you are calling. We know that you do all these things, Lord, that you might be honored and worshipped and people led to Christ and believers discipled and growing. And we know that you put it in the heart of Dr. Jello Tuanki, Lord, to seriously consider your call to him, to discern it, whether it means to leave everything behind, or to stay and yet still be a pastor, practicing his profession, Lord. And for the next year or two, Lord, the church will be praying for him. And he will be praying with us to discern your will. And Lord, as we mentor him, as he is exposed to the ministries of the church and rotated, we pray you will speak clearly to him. But in the meantime, Lord, because from this day forward, we do call him Pastor Jello Tuanki. Lord, will you work in his heart and in his life, in his personal ministry? Will you, Lord, watch over every aspect of his character? May you raise him, Lord, and develop him and grow him to be a First Timothy chapter 3 kind of person, to show all the qualities of a pastor that are listed there and in Titus chapter 1. We are praying that you will be not just with him but with his wife, and child. May you realize, Lord, that together with him, they are serving you. And we pray, therefore, for your blessing and guidance and protection on his life. We thank you, Lord, for his desire to serve you in the evangelizing and missions ministry of GCF. Father, continue to call people like him and continue to inspire the church by people like him to tell the church that it is your plan to raise people from within and bring them to leadership. Thank you for his testimony. Thank you for his life. Thank you, Lord, for Mrs. Twanky and their child. And thank you that they are here together as a family answering this serious call, Lord, to serve you in a more passionate and focused way. Thank you, Lord. And all God's people will say, Amen. Let's give them a hand, brothers and sisters in Christ. Praise the Lord. That's one of my favorite things to do in the ministry. Beloved, it's Resurrection Day. Now, I, I wanted to call it Easter like I called it this morning at the 8 a.m. service. But after the service, one lady approached me and said, Pastor, would you consider using another term besides Easter? Uh, because I know how it's associated with those pagan things. I said, you know what? It was the early Christians who used that term, but you're right. 
because sometimes it has, been, has some connotations. I'll use Resurrection Day rather than Easter. So I'm greeting you also, aside from Happy Easter, Happy Resurrection Day. All right. Now, in our scripture reading this morning, the first nine verses were about the suffering and death of the promised Messiah. If you were here last Friday, we took them up already. So this morning, we will focus on the last three verses, and I will read just portions of it because this is what we are going to focus on. It's really the topic and not the verses. Let me read verse 10 of Isaiah 53. It was the Lord's will to crush him, cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. Verse 11, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Did you notice those two verses? They are some of the clearest statements in the whole of Scripture that the promised Messiah would not only suffer, he'd not only die, he will rise again. It's very clear from the way it is worded. It says that he will see his offspring and prolong his days. It said he will see the light of life. So, we're talking about the resurrection of Christ. I'm reminded of an evangelist named D.L. Moody. You know, before Billy Graham, there was a man like him in the 1800s. And he was a great evangelist. Now, one time, he was suddenly, on very short notice, invited to speak at the funeral service and give a funeral sermon. Now, you know what we pastors do when we are given such emergencies? We quickly search the Bible for something that's already there. So he searched Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for a funeral sermon of Jesus. Because he would just go through it quickly and explain it line by line. You know what he found out? Whenever Jesus attended the funeral, he always disrupted the funerals because he would always make the dead person be raised back to life. <laughs> and so D.L. Moody could not find a single funeral sermon that Jesus preached because Jesus disrupted every funeral he attended. It's like this. Jesus plus death equals resurrection. That's what he found out. Try it. Try it for yourself. Open your Bibles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Every time Jesus was at a funeral, he disrupted it in a positive way. Beloved, the resurrection is a proven fact. Many who attend Easter Sunday already accept the resurrection of Christ as a fact. But some have not come to recognize and act on its significance. So this morning, the message is really for both believers and those who are still seeking the truth. For believers, because I hope you realize something, sometimes our mindset gets realigned in the wrong way. For, for the lost, for those who are seeking, I hope you realize that you can believe that Christ rose from the dead and yet not be saved. This morning, we're going to look at the resurrection. That was launched for us as a topic by Isaiah 53. We will look at the uniqueness, the necessity, and the urgency of the resurrection. The first one is the remarkable nature, the remarkableness of Christ's resurrection. And the first thing I'd like you to realize is that the resurrection of Christ had no precedent in history. Now, you might tell me, you know, Pastor, we heard about Lazarus, John 11. Uh, we heard about the widow's son in Luke 7. How about the daughter of Jairus in Luke 8? Weren't they resurrected? I know, they were. But after they were resurrected, all of them died a natural death. In fact, if you search your Bible, after Lazarus was resurrected, the enemies of Christ were planning to assassinate him. Why? Because he was living proof that Christ is the Son of God. That means, even though he was resurrected, the enemies of Christ knew Lazarus could be killed. That's what made Jesus different from all of them. He was resurrected, beloved. But he was resurrected to never die again because he had a glorified body. And for some of you, this is good news. The glorified body can eat food. Because Jesus showed that when he was resurrected. Now, 
That's why his resurrection is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 23 as a first of its kind. It's called the first fruits. It says, each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. It means never in history had somebody been risen from the grave like Christ. Never to die again. Never. But it means when you and I die, we will follow him. Now, this doctrine of the glorified body was a source of extensive debate in the Middle Ages. You know why? Because the theologians at that time were debating, for example, this question. And I guarantee you, they were sincere in their debate. It goes like this. If a cannibal eats a missionary, and then the cannibal eventually dies, and turns to dust. When God will create a glorified body, to whom does the dust belong? To the cannibal or the missionary? Uh, I'm glad they didn't mention about the, the missionary going out of the cannibal the natural way. That's also dust. But anyway, you know, my answer to that question is this. Whoever asked that had too much time in his hands. <laughs> Reminds me of Augustine uh, that... When he was asked another silly question, this question was, what was God doing before he created the universe? It is reported he was angry and he said, he was creating hell for people who ask questions like that. <laughs> Beloved, the glorified body and the truth of it, however, has a serious side. We know some Christians who also died during Typhoon Yolanda. We are told that by our colleagues from over there, down in Tacloban and other areas. Their bodies were never recovered. It begs the question, Pastor, what will happen to them when, when God will recreate their body into a glorified body from, from what happened, from the remains? Because their bodies were never discovered. We don't know if they were eaten by sharks, covered by anything. Well, it's the same question. What happens to those who were cremated and their ashes were scattered. And the answer there, beloved, is if you are a Christian, God in his power can recreate the atoms and molecules of you if he has to. Because if you can raise the dead, you can do anything in this universe. That's how the power of resurrection is described in Ephesians chapter 1. There is no greater power in the universe than to raise somebody from the dead. It's the power of creation all over again. And if God can create the universe out of nothing, can he not recreate you out of the dust even if you were eaten by a cannibal? Well, of course he can. So, beloved, the resurrection of Christ had no precedent. Second thing that makes it remarkable is that the resurrection was unique because of the reasons that led to his death. The death of Christ was the death of one who was sinless for those who were sinners. Do you remember this, beloved? Before Christ came, every sinner who wanted to be forgiven by God had to bring a lamb. The lamb had to be killed because God was saying, sin always has the cost of death. But Christ came. And when Christ was offered on the cross, it was God saying, stop bringing your lambs for an offering. It's over. The bringing of lambs is done. We are now going to give you the lamb. God himself is the one who would provide the lamb. The lamb would be sinless. The lamb would be perfect. His name is Jesus Christ. And when God offered this lamb, it is now for you and me to say, I accept that offering, Lord. Or you can actually tell God indirectly, I refuse to accept your offering. I want to keep bringing my offering. I want to do it the old way, God. I bring you my offering of good works, my offering of religion, my offering of, of, of sacrifices. I want to bring it. But God has been saying, it's done. It's over. No more offerings. I'll not accept anything because here is my son. That's why the resurrection is unique. The reasons that led to his death that made him rise from the grave are unique, beloved. And you know that Isaiah 53 has been very clear about that. 
verses 1 to 9. You know that John the Baptist, that was his central message. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what he meant. It's over. No more sacrifices will be accepted from any human being. Will you accept or reject the sacrifice named Jesus Christ? That's why the resurrection of Christ is remarkable. But it's not just remarkable, it is relevant, beloved. The relevance of Christ's resurrection is first of all because the resurrection proved that Christ is who he claimed to be. Now, these five things are already familiar to you, so I'll be going through them a bit quickly. Remember this. Jesus was never unclear, never unclear about his claim to be the Son of God. In fairness to the enemies who had him killed, in fairness to them, they never had any doubts about his claim. Look at John 19, 7. When Christ was brought to trial before Pilate, the Jews said, we have a law, and according to our law, he should be killed because he claimed to be the Son of God. You know, the old enemies of Christ were at least more intelligent than the enemies of Christ today. There are cults saying, and they're just very near you, on your cable TV, on your books, they're on the internet. They're saying Christ is not God. I mean, he never claimed to be God. I feel sorry for them. These modern enemies of Christ are much less intelligent than the old enemies of Christ who at least recognize Christ clearly claimed to be God, beloved. And his enemies then were very clear on that. That's why he said he should be executed. And Romans 1, 4 affirms Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power when he rose by his resurrection from the dead. In other words, when he rose from the dead, his claim to be God was proven. If Jesus was not the Son of God, beloved, he should win an Oscar. Why? He played the role perfectly. No one talked like him. He talked like the Son of God. He acted like the Son of God. He did things that only the Son of God would do. And if he is not the Son of God, he is the greatest actor who ever lived. And he played the part really well. This echoes what C.S. Lewis said about Christ. One who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg. Or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. But you know who he is, don't you? He is the Son of God. Second thing about the relevance of Christ's resurrection is that it was necessary to prove that Jesus accomplished what he promised. While he was alive, he promised. He clearly said, I will die and I will rise again. Beloved, if somebody tells you he will die and he will rise again, I guarantee you 100% he will not rise again. Uh, you better send him your condolences ahead. Only Christ could do that. No one in history has founded a system of belief and said he would die and rise again. But by rising from the grave, Jesus had proven that everything else he said is true. Because he said he would die and then he rose and then he did. It means everything else he said is true. That's why Romans 5, 9 to 10 says, If we are reconciled to God through the death of His Son, how much more shall we be saved through His life? It means His death reconciled us to God, but His being alive means our being alive to God. Jesus had to rise from the grave. Let's state a hypothetical situation. Let's say you put your trust in Jesus Christ. He says he is the Savior of the world. If you accept him as Savior and Lord, you will be saved. After you do, you learn he never rose again. What does it mean? 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter says, If Christ is not raised from the dead, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Christ cannot be Savior 
if he did not rise from the grave. It means he's a liar. And you know he's not. He rose from the grave, beloved. This is the question. Are you alive today? Because you have accepted the death and resurrection of Christ personally. Have you believed in it so much that he suffered, he died, he rose again for you that you said, that's for me. I believe it literally. And I believe it so completely I'll stake eternity on it. I'll stake my life here and my life eternally on it. I accept you, Jesus, as my Savior from all my sins you've never done that, beloved, then you will not be experiencing the eternal life that Jesus promised. When the noted preacher, Reverend Philip Brooks, got sick of a serious illness, he refused to see anybody from his church. Uh, it's not that he was bad. Have you experienced being sick? And then the whole barangay visits you. And after that, you feel sicker than before. I mean, you never got a chance to rest. That was his idea. So despite his well-meaning church members coming to see him, he didn't want to see anyone. Then he heard the famous critic of Christianity, a well-known attorney named Attorney Robert Ingersoll, also a noted author, dropped by. He told his servant, please let him in. And so Robert Ingersoll was allowed to see him. And Robert Ingersoll said, I appreciate this very much, Reverend. But why do you see me when you deny yourself to your friends? It's like this, said Reverend Brooks. I feel confident of seeing my friends in the next life. I think it's the last time I will see you. <laughs> why could he say that? You see, he knew. He knew. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. Jesus died as the Son of God. Jesus rose as the Son of God. So Reverend Brooks knew there is a life after this, and I will be in that life. My church members will be there, but not this critic of Christianity. Do you know where you will be in the life to come? Thirdly, the resurrection was necessary to confirm prophecy. Psalm 16.10 is a very clear prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ, and Peter was the one who confirmed this. It says, You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. According to Peter, David who wrote this was not speaking of himself. Why? Because David evidently decayed, not Jesus. And these are among some of the many prophecies about the resurrection. You already saw Isaiah 53, 10, and 11. Fourthly, the resurrection was a logical necessity. According to Acts 2.24, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Peter, who again said this, is saying, well, he is God. And if he is God, how can death be stronger or bigger than God? If he is God and he died a human death, he cannot stay dead. It's a logical necessity, according to Peter. And finally, the resurrection of Christ is important because it's a necessary element of saving faith. In the whole Bible, Old and New Testament, whenever you say, I have faith in God, that was all that was needed for you. To be saved and forgiven by God. Not works. Not faithless works. But faith alone. The greatest example of that is Abraham. The father of our faith. But I hope you will now realize when you read Hebrews chapter 11. That the faith of Abraham in God included a faith in the resurrecting power of God beloved. Because in Hebrews 11:17 it describes. And I will read it for you. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Do you remember that story? Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering on Mount Moriah. Hebrews 19 tells us, Hebrews 11:19 tells us, Abraham reasoned God could raise the dead. You know what Abraham thought sincerely? 
God will let me slit the throat of my son, spill his blood, end his life, burn him to ashes. And then from the ashes, God will resurrect him from the dead. He was wrong about God's method, but not about God's character. He was right. And that's why Hebrews 11, 19 says, figuratively, he did receive him from the grave, from death. But you know, Isaac was not allowed to be killed. But Abraham's faith, beloved, was a resurrection faith. Romans 10, 9 is the New Testament counterpart of that faith of Abraham. Personal faith in the resurrection of Christ is necessary because it's a vital element in a faith that leads to salvation itself. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, I know it doesn't strike you as much. Let me reword this, and then you'll get what it's saying. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, And do not believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. You are not saved. If I say I am a Christian. If I say I have put my faith in Christ. Suffering on the cross. Dying for me. I accept him as my sacrifice. And then I say. Oh by the way. That Jesus resurrection. uh, It's all made up. I know if we excavate Jerusalem enough. We will find his bones. You know you can confidently say I am not. A Christian. It takes faith to believe. Not only that Christ died on the cross for us as a lamb. It takes, it takes faith to believe that lamb rose again from the dead. Because if the lamb did not rise from the dead, he's a liar and not a lamb. And he is not a liar. He rose from the grave, beloved. And so we end with our final point. The response to Christ. Resurrection. Why do some people, and I would say in the Philippines, many are like this. They genuinely believe Christ rose from the grave. Why are they still not saved? First is that they fail to realize our true condition in connection with the death and resurrection of Christ. In other words, we never said that was for me. We just believed in it intellectually. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. In a personal way, it was my sins and yours that nailed him there. And beloved, being helplessly dead in our sins makes the resurrection of Christ so important. The problem is that we do not recognize we are eternally lost apart from believing in his death. And resurrection. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Jump to verse 6. And God raised us up. The word in Greek refers to resurrection. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms. Now how did that happen? How did verse 1 become verse 6? Verse 1, dead. Verse 6, raised us up. Verses 8 to 9 of Ephesians 2 tell us how. It is by grace you have been saved. Not of works. It is through faith. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. Do you have any phobias? Some of you have the fear of what? Fear of heights. Some of you who can afford to travel all over the world do not. Why? You're afraid of flying. Some of you are afraid of spiders. Some of you would rather die than do public speaking and so on. But the sum of all fears, we are told, is the fear of death. The fear of death. You can summarize all of your fears and nothing would top the fear of death. Of dying. I believe the funeral industry plays an important role in helping us to handle our fear of death. You know, whenever someone dies, The funeral industry will do its best to make the person look like she was just sleeping. So some of you will visit the funeral of your friend and say, Oh, she looks so natural. Well, the truth is she is so dead. (laughs) And some of you ladies perhaps are thinking, I wonder who the makeup artist is. 
maybe I could contract her for my next party. <laughs> because they do a great job of making that look palatable. But here's the truth. No matter how well they do it, death will visit you and me personally. None of us will escape it. Only the rapture. That's why. You understand the early Christians now? They were always hoping for the rapture. You understand why. Even though you're a Christian, you still have uncertainty. How will I die, Lord? Will I die at the age of 99? Will I die tomorrow, next week? So the early Christians were saying, Even so come, Lord Jesus. Let the rapture happen now. No more uncertainty. So even though you're sure where you're going, there's still uncertainty about death. Beloved, the question, therefore, is this. Are you ready to face death? How do you stand with Christ? And here's another reason why people who believe in the resurrection might still not be saved. Failing to grasp the majesty, power, holiness of Christ as he now is resurrected and as he will be when we stand before him. Just to say it in a, in a short sentence, it means people forget who Christ really is. Again, because of popular media, we think Christ is a good-looking man who is ready to save us if we will turn to him. The saving part is true. The good-looking part is probably not true. If you read Isaiah 53, 1 to 5, it says he did not have anything attractive to him. Beloved, read the book of Revelations. I know some of you get migraines when you read it. I understand you. It gives me headaches. It's so hard to interpret, but I'd like you to read it and focus on the description of Christ there. The description of Christ there is who He is right now. Right now, He is an offered Savior. But when you reject Him all your life and you run out of time and you draw your last breath, you've never accepted the Lamb of God who died and was raised. Your time is up. The Savior offered is the dreadful judge described in the book of Revelations as the King of kings, Lord of lords, the one who tramples nations underfoot, the one before whom the angels of heaven, the armies of heaven are just following in humble obedience. You ought to read Revelation sometimes. Just look at how it describes Christ. If it doesn't strike fear into your heart, I don't know what else will, beloved. But here's the most important reason why people do not come to Christ. They fail to take the death of re and resurrection of Christ personally. Now, I, now, I know we have a saying in Tagalog. Walang personalan. Uh, it means, in English, for our foreigner friends, don't take it too personally. It wasn't meant against you. Here, it's correct. You do take it too personally. You should. When it comes to the resurrection and death of Christ, take it personally. Because if you do not, it becomes something for the head and never reaches your heart. John Stott rightly said, before we begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. And here's a good example of those who took it personally. Acts 2, 36 to 41. Peter was giving the first sermon during Pentecost. He was telling people, you, you people of Jerusalem, you're responsible for crucifying Christ. And then he said in so many words, but this Christ, by his resurrection, was proven, according to Acts 2, 36, to be both Lord and and Christ, it says there, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and believe in Christ. Verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized. 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 people took the message personally. They said, we were responsible for crucifying Christ. We are just as responsible today, not just them. 
But if we are responsible, the same Christ we have crucified with our very own hands, by our own accountability, He rose from the grave. And if you're asking, what shall we do? Do what Peter said, repent and believe in Christ. Accept Him as God's offered lamb, as God's Savior offered for you. You can tell Him that right now while you're sitting down. In closing, we said restoring the resurrection because we must restore the resurrection to its rightful role. It's there to prove not only that Christ is the Son of God sacrificed for us. That's one role. But its role is also to make you and me see His life, His suffering, His death, His resurrection as one whole thing we believe in. And we believe in it to the point that we say, I accept it. I accept the whole truth of all of it, and I accept Christ as my Savior. I know I'm talking to mostly believers now, so let me speak to you who are believers already. I challenge you believers today to let the resurrection of Christ change your worldview, your perspective of the world. I'm praying you not only share the message of hope, but may you live in the hope that resurrection can give you. There was a soldier who served in Bosnia. During the time there was a war between Serbia and Croatia. He stepped on a landmine. It blew both of his legs off. When he woke up, he was in a military base in Germany. When he saw that he had no more legs, he lost the will to live. He refused to cooperate with the doctors. He refused to talk to anybody. He just wanted to die. The only thing that kept him from dying was he couldn't kill himself. I mean, there was no way he could do it. One day, a visitor came, sat beside him. Of course, this man ignored him. And the visitor took out a harmonica and started to play. Again, the patient, the soldier, just ignored him completely. The following day, the visitor came again. And the day after, spent a few minutes to play the harmonica. After several days, the visitor played a different tune. He played a lively tune, and he began dancing to his own tune. But still, the soldier, who was depressed, wouldn't even look at him. Finally, the visitor said, Why don't you just give me one smile and show the world you're still alive? Finally, the depressed soldier spoke. He said, I might as well be dead in the situation I'm in. Okay, answered the visitor, you say you're dead, but you're not as dead as someone they crucified 2,000 years ago. But you know, he came out of it okay. That's easy for you to say, the patient replied. If you were in my situation, you'd sing a different tune. The visitor said, I know 2,000 years is far in the past. So maybe an up-to-date example will help you believe it can be done. The visitor pulled up his pants. It showed two artificial legs. Turned out he was also a soldier who also lost both legs. Just like the man on that bed, he too had lost the will to live before. He too had also desired to die rather than to go on. But because of Jesus Christ, who entered his life, his I can't became God can. And he was now there to share the hope of Christ with a young soldier in that bed. Beloved, this true story was mentioned just to tell you this. The fact that Christ is alive gives us hope for living today. It's not good just for our future in heaven. It's for today. It's for my life today. So I want to share to you what what Resurrection Day means to me personally. Whenever we have this Sunday, it's a reminder to me that in the course of the 12 months of each year, my worldview gets rearranged. I guess it comes from reading too many books. I have to read so that there's something I could tell people. And I get lost in details and ideas that seem relevant to my life and at least once a year. Once a year, 
I have to realign myself, realign my mind to the most important things again. So what I am going to tell you now is what I have just been telling myself. Please listen to this. Beloved, there is nothing more relevant than to any human soul than the resurrection of Christ. Nothing can top that. There is no more suitable foundation to build your life on than the resurrection of Christ. Christ's resurrection offers you and me the promise that we will also be raised from the dead. That's why a soldier who has lost bought his leg can tell another, you don't have to wish to die. There's hope. And like Paul repeatedly tells us, beloved, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is still at work in you and me to make us into what Christ wants us to be. It's that kind of power. It's the kind of power that can raise a person into a glorified body someday. It's not a weak power. And once a year, I have to tell myself, what does this power mean to you? How have you lived for the past 12 months? And most often, and I'm confessing this to you, I feel guilty that I have not lived in the full power of that. I forget because I worry about the church. I worry about those who have left. I worry about those who are here who are struggling in their business, their marriage, their problems become mine. I worry for them. My heart breaks for them. Then God has to remind me once a year, you have forgotten the power that enables you to live. It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Stop living like Christ is dead. He's alive. And Christian. If you're ever in that same situation, a person who's saying, well, Christ is alive, but it doesn't mean anything to you anymore, at least once a year, this time, we can just tell ourselves, let's stop living like Christ is dead. He's alive. And that means something in my life and yours. We cannot live mediocre Christian lives. You cannot be mediocre in your office. You cannot be mediocre in your profession. You cannot be mediocre in your Christian walk, because Christ is a lie. Beloved in Christ, what does the empty tomb mean for you? Is it an accessory to your life, or is it essential? Please, allow the miracle of resurrection to turn your life right side up. Remind you of the foundation upon which your hope is laid. The only reason why we believe in Christ is because He rose from the grave. And that's why, beloved, we say this. Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. I hope you will live in the power of that resurrection. I hope you were reminded today. Let's stand for the benediction, beloved. And we will do it differently. I'm going to call the pastors and elders to please come to the front, including cycled out elders. You're still included as elders. Pastors and elders, as they come to the front, we will have a benediction the way the ancient church did it. During Easter Sunday, the pastor or worship leader would stand before the congregation and say, Christ is risen. The congregation would respond, Christ is risen indeed. They would do that three times, and then that would end the service. Could we do that today? That's our benediction, beloved. I'll say, Christ is risen, and you will say, Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Happy Resurrection Day. God bless you all. Go with God.